You can't consider low iron just on its own. You have to look at the bigger picture. Unfortunately, modern medicine says, oh, you've got low iron, take more iron. Now, you know already from my other videos that that may not be working for you. And the other videos will show you how to multiply the benefits of the supplements and the iron in your food. However, you have to put iron in the context of your total diet on all the nutrients you take on its own. You can't consider low iron in isolation, and it rarely exists in isolation from other nutritional deficiencies. First of all, it's shared food. So if you're having ultra-processed foods or on a restrictive diet, I, I met a, 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 a bodybuilder in the sauna just last week, a young lady, and she was having all these other problems associated with her diet restrictions. Low iron was one of them, low magnesium, and a whole raft of these things. So first of all, it's just the foods you're eating. The second one is a common source of absorption. I'll touch on a little bit of that, and I've covered that in my other videos. Please watch the other videos to get the full picture of iron. I didn't want to put them into one long, long iron video, so I've broken them up so that you can see and understand it. And you will know more about iron absorption than the specialists. So the second pathway, or the second issue, is a common absorption pathway. Calcium, for example, and magnesium, you already know, and copper and zinc can block iron absorption, and vice versa. So having high iron might take the extra, extra iron as a supplement, may block calcium or magnesium or zinc or other things. And the third one is there's a metabolic overlap so that certain nutrients, and this is what I'm going to highlight right now, will improve the absorption, digestion, and utilization of iron. And it's a big picture, so it's not just iron. And that's what explains why some people have asked me in the other videos, how come I've got this imbalance? I've got high ferritin, but low iron, high hemoglobin, and low this. It's because you need all of these nutrients to act in some form of symphony, a concert, so that they can work together in a positive way. And I'll explain that right now. However, also understand that low ferritin, low iron can be influenced by lots of other things which you need to look into right now. So if you've got chronic low iron, you've followed my other videos and it's not going up, there may be other conditions, for example, inflammation, which can affect the digestion and the ferritin levels that show up on the readings. Chronic illness, liver disease, chronic kidney disease, uh, uh, bacterial or viral infections, all of these alcohol consumption, these can all influence what shows up in terms of the iron in your blood. But let's get down to the nutrients, because if you can understand the nutrients, and I'll try and put it in perspective. This Vitamin C is critical for iron absorption, digestion and utilization in the body. So make sure you get lots of vitamin C. Now vitamin C, you can actually consume that with your iron rich foods or your iron supplements or, or both. And it really does make a difference in the clinical trials. And again, I've, re I've, I've repeated this in all of my videos. That's how important vitamin C is. The amount, some people will say, oh, 200, 250 milligrams. The nutritional doctors and researchers I know talk about 2,000 milligrams or more. So vitamin C is a very common deficiency in the Western world because we're not even eating the fruit, the nuts, the seeds, the veggies, and all those things with vitamin C in it anymore. And so it helps with digestion and absorption, and it helps with mobilization of the ferritin, which is the stored form of iron. So some people have commented, as I've already suggested, oh, I've got high ferritin, but low this. It could be because not enough vitamin C or some of the other nutrients to actually help mobilize the ferritin that's stored in the blood into the red blood cells, transferrin, the, the one that transfers it around the body and into the hemoglobin and other areas of the body and functions. So vitamin C is critical for that mobilization of it, as well as digestion and absorption. Then you've got vitamin a. This is a fat-soluble vitamin. Vitamin C is a water-soluble one. Vitamin A is a fat-soluble one. If you're on your beef liver capsules, you'll be pleased to know you're probably getting lots of vitamin A. Otherwise, you'll probably find you'll need to supplement with, supplement with some vitamin A and or lots of fatty foods. Apart from the animal sources, you can get them in some nuts and seeds, for example. And vitamin A helps mobilize that stored ferritin again. 
much the same or very different but similar action it helps convert the ferritin which is a stored level of iron in the blood into the red blood cells where it's actually going to be able to uh, do the right functions the formation of hemoglobin carrying oxygen around the body and so on it also helps iron absorption so consuming Vitamin A with a meal can increase the absorption and studies have shown that when they add vitamin A and iron together, it increases the iron in the blood if you're just taking a supplement of iron. So vitamin A synergizes that digestion and absorption of iron. So a great little adjunct there. Now, copper gets talked about in a lot of ways, and there's a positive side of copper and a little bit of a negative one. The negative one is that copper will compete with iron. And if you're taking a lot of copper, it's going to block the iron. So what you want to do is separate those two out. Now, in a, in a really healthy, balanced diet, you're going to get both of those in every meal, and it won't matter. But if you're on any ultra-processed foods or uh, on a diet, and you're taking iron supplements and or copper supplements, you need to separate those out. So as I've already suggested in my other videos, iron supplementing in the morning and then having some copper rich foods later on in the day, separate from the iron supplements. So copper is essential for uh, literally the enzymes which help release the iron into its active form. And here, seroloplasmin, it helps mobilize the stored iron in the liver so it can effectively be used so you need copper and what's interesting in all of these nutrients i'm talking about there are a lot of people who are deficient in all of them many of them and at least some of them so it's really important when you get your bloods tested to check out what your vitamin c levels is vitamin a levels and copper levels and so on and so on as we go through here but so it helps mobilize the stored iron and this other enzyme that it helps generate it's copper dependent hephaestin and this one actually helps for the iron absorption from food so again um, in, a, in a healthy meal for example i love sardines sardines are a great source of iron they're rich in copper too zinc and and all these other things and that's where that balancing act comes out that I said. But if you're supplementing with iron, separate out the supplementing iron with copper supplementing. Two things very important. Now, a copper deficiency often mimics anemia, iron anemia. So always check your copper levels at the same time. And so, so do some of the other mineral deficiencies. For example, zinc deficiency can, and even a magnesium deficiency can mimic some of the signs and symptoms of iron deficiency. and and literally show up as an iron deficiency. Then you've got your B vitamins, B6, B9, and B12, and these go into the red blood cell formation. So not necessarily the absorption, but the utilization of it. So again, you need B vitamins, and you get those in your green veggies, your nuts, your seeds, and all of those whole foods. So my first source of all this, while supplementing is critical, and I've given you in the other ones the, the ways to increase it, dramatically increase the iron absorption and digestion with lactoferrin and the right singular probiotic. But what you want to make sure is when it gets into the body that it can also do all the functions it needs. So you need a holistic, Mediterranean, rich, nutrient-rich diet. And then you've got B2, which also helps in the iron mobilization. It's not much good having it stuck in the stores in the liver or stuck in ferritin if it's not being mobilized and utilized in the body for all the other functions, 101 functions that iron gets used for. Then you've got another one, zinc. And, and again, having zinc supplements with iron supplements are going to block each other. Having huge zinc supplement and bear in mind that a lot of people are zinc deficient as well, so get it checked out. So having a lot of zinc will block the iron absorption. Hence, iron absorption in the morning, zinc supplementation later on during the day. And so it competes with iron absorption. It helps in the red blood cell production. And here, there is this little hormone produced in the liver called hepcidin. And I go in length about explaining about hepcidin because hepcidin is the great iron balancer it determines how much you will absorb or not and a little bit of the regulation in the blood as well so hepcidin you have to get right watch that video and so hepcidin regulation zinc is linked with that 
So if you want to make sure you've got the right balance of hepcidin, which regulates the absorption of iron, if you've got too much, by the way, hepcidin, I'll give you a summary, uh, then you are not going to absorb iron no matter how much you try to consume. So going back to that. And then inflammation, zinc is a great anti-inflammatory nutrient, helps lower inflammation, which affects hepcidin anyway. Then we go to another mineral that you're all involved in, you all know about, you've heard about many times, magnesium. And again, in the 21st century diet, we are magnesium deficient. And so if you understand that, it helps with the red blood cell production and improves hemoglobin function. Now, magnesium also will compete with iron, so you don't have a supplement in the morning with iron and magnesium together. You have the iron and then magnesium later on. I take my magnesium supplementation, magnesium uh, glycinate or bisglycinate. Um, I take them at night because they help with the muscle relaxation and lots of other things as well and help with the sleep. Good little hint in there to see my other videos on sleep. So then we come up to, and by the way, if you're iron deficient, you probably have associated sleep problems as well. Not just fatigue and exhaustion, rundown, uh, all these other things, but, but probably sleep as well. Now here is a very interesting one, vitamin D. This is so critical, and everyone has heard about vitamin D and supplement with vitamin D, but the best vitamin D and this is a hormone, it's not a real vitamin, but it's a fat soluble um, vitamin D hormone in the body. And it's produced in the body. And it's produced from exposure to, vit to, to sunlight. However, however, if you do not have the right nutrients in the body, and guess which one it is? Iron, you can't absorb it. A little bit on that later, but vitamin D suppresses hepcidin. So you need plenty of vitamin D to keep the hepcidin down. The hepcidin, high hepcidin, low digestion absorption of iron. High vitamin D, it lowers the hepcidin and increases the digestion. You have to have adequate levels of vitamin D in your body. You have to have them. So the first is the sunlight, and the second is supplementing. Make sure you're supplementing with vitamin D. Then it comes down to vitamin D, so it suppresses hepcidin, it decreases the inflammation and helps with the red blood cell production. However, this is the catch-22 with iron. If you've got low iron, iron is low iron. Low iron is essential. It's absolutely essential for vitamin D production in your skin cells, in your liver. So the skin is radiated with sunlight, the vitamin D is activated, it goes to your liver, the liver then converts it using vitamin D into the active form of vitamin D, calcitrol, what's called 1,2,5-hydroxy vitamin D3. That's the same sup as you can get as a supplement and it activates it, but it can only activate it if you've got plenty of iron. So if you are iron deficient, you are more than likely vitamin D deficient as well. So a lot of my nutritional GPs and research with friends I know will really emphasize the need to get out there. And I have another video all about benefits of sunlight and, and all these other, sunlight is an essential nutrient for you. Everybody needs sunlight. As you can see, I get out in the sun every single day to maximize it, not sunburn, but to get the, my vitamin D, because I've got good iron, only with good iron, can you get the vitamin D activated through the skin, liver axis, into an active form of vitamin D3. Otherwise, it's just stored in your liver, which is what you don't want. You want it mobilized and being used. So in all here, what we've done, or what I've done, is given you a picture of how all these other nutrients are balanced together. Remember, low iron rarely exists in isolation. All of these, or any one of these, could be low as well. And if they are, they could be contributing to your low iron, or your low iron could be contributing to them on both sides of the equation. Now, if you like this information and you think it's worthwhile, make sure you tick the boxes and share this information with your friends because there is nobody out there giving you the whole picture. Check out the other four or five videos I have on iron and it will give you the whole picture of iron and what you can do about it.